You know, everything we know about God uh, comes by, only comes from one source, okay? And that source is what we refer to as divine revelation. It is, and it is by divine revelation that God interacts with his creations, okay? That's how we get to know him. It is divine, by divine revelation that uh, we know, uh, see, God places around us all these things that speak to us about who he is. Things like nature, mm -hmm. th things like the heavens above us, uh, things like history, things like our personal experiences with him. And it is only, uh, but, and, and when we understand those things, see, all those things tell us of God. But if you really want to know who God is, if you really want to experience God in your life, this is where you have to go. This is where you get the true evidence of who God is. This is where you get to meet Him on a personal one-to-one -one basis. This is where you experience who He is and how He is. You learn His attributes. You learn about His faith. You learn about how He is always true. You learn everything about Him in this book. And so, when I ask you if you are ready for the Word of God, I'm asking you, really, are you ready to get to know Him a little bit better? And I, and I draw a lot of attention to that because I want you to focus on what we're doing here this morning. What we do here this morning, whenever we divide the Word of God, which means to cut straight, Paul was a tent maker, Paul used to cut, cut very straight because it took a lot of skins to make a big tent. Whenever we divide the Word of God, it's important that we have all our focus on what He's trying to say to us. Okay? Okay. Nice. Well said. So again, for our source scripture this morning, it is Romans 10, 19 through 21. And if you're ready for the Word of God, would you please signify that by saying amen? amen. And would you now please join me in standing out of respect for the life-changing truth which is the Word of God. Romans 10, 19 through 20, re 21 reads as follows. But I say, did Israel not know? First Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. But Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask me. But to Israel, he says, all day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Thank you. You can be seated. So Paul immediately begins to the point in our source scripture this morning that Israel is ignorant of its own scripture in regards to predictions about salvation. The first word in your outline this morning is ignorant. It, Israel was ignorant in what its own scripture said about the predictions of salvation that were to come. That truth has been implied throughout this chapter. But now, Paul wants to stress that point as he closes his thought here. And he wants, to, he wants, to know, he wants his readers to know that this is based upon fact. I'm not giving you conjecture here this morning. This is based upon fact. Fact, And that's why in verse 19 he begins with a rhetorical question, but I say, did Israel not know? As he's already noted, God, you know, Paul has already talked to uh, about Abraham and his descendants, as it says in Genesis 12:3, uh, that the whole earth shall be blessed. The whole earth would be blessed by Abraham's descendants. And when you read that word descendant, it's just another, uh, it's just a phrase for Israel, Abraham and his, his descendants, that they would be witnesses to all the earth. Exodus 19, 5 and 6 tells us a kingdom, that they would be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And so those are the words uh, that are in the scriptures that Israel should be aware of. And they, they like to act as if they, did, shouldn't, they didn't know, but they do know those words. It's, it's just that they could never accept those words. God's universal parameters of salvation 
was a salvation for all mankind, but the Jewish people wanted to think that it was only theirs. That it was only theirs, and that was their biggest problem with Jesus Christ, is that he offered salvation to everyone. Paul continues now, and he, and he begins quoting, and first, he quotes, he quotes Moses, and he says, he says that Moses said, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. Moses says to the people of Israel, I will provo that, that, that these, are, this, these are the thoughts of God, and I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. And what Paul is saying is that God's blessing of the Gentiles who would believe in him would make his chosen people, Israel, jealous and angry. That's all he's saying. And some 1,500 years before Paul wrote his letter to the church in Rome, Moses had declared a salvation message that indicates that if salvation would reach the Gentiles as well as the Jews. Jesus spoke the, spoke the same thing in the parable of Matthew 21:33. He says in that, in that parable that there was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it. He dug a wine press in it and built a tower and he leased it to vine dressers and went away into a far country. Okay? So what happens? Well, the, the, the renting vine dressers, they beat, they kill, they stone two successive groups of slaves that came to reap the owner's produce. It's his property. He should have the opportunity to reap his produce. And then what happens? They actually kill the landowner's son. And what happens? What does it say? It says that those wretches, those wretches are brought to a wretched end. And then it says that the landowner now, he rents out the vineyard to other vine growers. You know who the other vine growers are? It's us. It's the Gentiles. He rents it out to other vine growers who would pay him the proceeds at the proper season. Okay? So that's a picture. That's a picture of the nation of Israel. I'll talk about another parable later. Now, so Paul moves. He quotes Moses. And now he'll quote Isaiah. Why do you think he quotes Moses? And then he quotes Isaiah. See, Paul perfectly knows his audience. He quotes Moses because Moses is emblematic of the law. law. He, quote, he quotes Isaiah because Isaiah is emblematic of the prophets. He quotes from the law and the prophets to speak to his readers. And he says that Isaiah, he says, was very bold, he says. And the Lord says through Isaiah, he says, I was found by those who did not seek me. Who, who didn't seek him? It was the Gentiles. And I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. The Gentiles had never asked for Jesus Christ at this time in history. It was the, it was the nation Israel that was seeking out a Messiah. And so Moses, as I said, who represents the law, Isaiah, who represents the prophet, Paul quotes from them to hammer home his point that he wants to establish that Israel's rejection of her Messiah, that was a surprise to God. This isn't a circumstance or a situation where God says, Oh, wow, I, didn't, I, I thought they would go ahead and accept Jesus. No. God knew that this would happen before it ever happened. He knew of the rejection of His chosen people. God would be, it says that God would be found by the Gentiles. God knew that would happen. He would be found by those who did not seek Him out. He would be made manifest to those who did not even ask Him. So Paul continues then in this vein as he, he tries to speak to those that would question the, the universal extent of God's salvation. And he says, and it says, this is a very interesting phrase, all day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. That word that we translate in the English to disobedient is apetheo. Theo is obedient. It's, theo really means to have knowledge of. Ape, whenever, whenever you heard, hear the word ape in the Greek, it means it's the opposite. 
or it's against. So the idea is that, and when you translate that word in the Greek, it means to, it not only means to be against, it actually means to fight against, to speak against. So what is being said here is that God's own people throughout the his, their history, for the most part, fought against and opposed the truth of God. The God who had lovingly called them and graciously and patiently, as the words say there, stretched out his hands to them. God was calling these people and yet they wouldn't listen. In Luke 14, 21 through 24, we read another parable. Remember where a man gave a great banquet and none of the guests would come. Okay? It says... Uh, the, 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 he sent out his slaves to invite all his friends to come to the banquet. And the slaves come back and they say, uh, no one has come. And he tells them of their excuses. Who are, the, who are these guests that were invited? Jews. They're, the, they're the nation Israel, the Jews. And it says that the master of the house became angry and he said to his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in here the poor, the maimed, the, line, the, the lame, and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded, and still there is room. Then the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come. That means to, to beg them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste of my supper. Who were those that they went out and got from the highway and the hedges? That was you and me. God's invitation to his loving salvation. God's invitation for eternal life is an invitation that is open to all. So the big picture here is the idea of Israel's rejection of this salvation. Because of their persistent rejection of him, Jesus said in Matthew 23, 37, he said... Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets, right, and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, that's a picture of the disobedient heart of Israel. But you know what? That's a picture of some hearts that are here this morning. Yeah, that is. Because there's hearts here this morning that repetitively hear the truth, and yet they continue to reject it. They want to live a life that looks good, and that's what the Jews did, realistically, because of their legalism. They lived lives that looked good. They lived lives that were even moral in many ways. They were thought to be good, good people. But see, God's not interested. I hate to say it. God's not interested in good people. God's interested in saving people. And God's interested in lost people. Because he wants to make those lost people save people. And you know what? Listen to me. There ain't no people in the middle. There's two categories. When you go to judgment day, there's only two categories. Those that know him and those that don't know him. And if you're in one of those don't know categories, if you're in that don't know category this morning, man, you come up right now. And I'll lead you in a prayer of, of salvation. Because you know what? You need it. Because the word says you are not guaranteed the next breath from your mouth. You're not guaranteed that. There's no guarantee this morning that the Lord will allow you to exist one more moment to taste his gift of eternal salvation. And that's, listen, that is the truth of the word of God. And I can't make it any plainer to you. But you know what? My heart is continually burdened for you. Because I know you're here this morning. I wouldn't 
I wouldn't, I wouldn't keep saying it if I didn't firmly believe it. So we've really got to understand that in this picture of Israel, we can have a picture of ourselves. This was a picture of me for 38 years as I resisted, as I rejected, as I thought, oh, I'm a pretty good guy. But good guys, in this instance, finish last. Good guys, in this instance, uh, see, Israel's rejection of Jesus Christ was a tragic, tragic failure on their part. You know, you think of all the people that have existed in the nation Israel from that time till today. And how many people have perished and still don't know Jesus Christ. And you know Christianity in, in Israel is a very, very weak religion. The Israeli government frowns upon Christian missionaries in their country. The major religion of Israel today is nationalism because they have great pride in their country and they're worried about the, the safety of their country and the security of their country. So that, that's their major religion. It's a tragic, tragic thing that happened to the Jews. And you know how the Jews got to where they are? Do you know who led the Jewish people to their condition? It was the, pe the people that led their religion. It was their leaders. That's who led them. It was the leaders and the people's sheep-like adherence to what the leaders told them. See, the Jewish people, they didn't major on the Word of God. They majored on what the, the scribes and Pharisees told them. They didn't pay attention. They didn't, they didn't delve into the Word for themselves. They believed their leaders. Never believe your leaders. Believe what the Spirit tells you is true. If your leader is Spirit-led, your Spirit and His Spirit will be in, in accord. They will be, remember we spoke about being of one like-mindedness on Wednesday night? They will be of one mind, but you have the responsibility, as a parent today, you have the responsibility to make sure what your children hear, hear is, is the truth. As a grandparent, I believe you have the same responsibility. And yet, we always want somebody else to do it. We don't want to do it for ourselves. So, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end there today. Uh, I'm going to finish, you know, God made a lot of promises to Israel, okay? And, and really, that's what the 11th chapter is going to speak to. We're going to speak about the promises of God. And God makes promises that are of two categories. Did you, did you know that? God makes unconditional promises, okay? Promises like His covenants, okay? God actually makes promises. You know who God, when God makes a promise to, you know he, who He makes an oath with? He makes an oath with Himself. He makes a promise and then He affirms it. Do you remember when uh, God had Abraham take, I think, I think it was a cow, and he had him cut it in half, okay? And he put it on each side, and and so there was room to walk through the middle of it. And you know who walked through the middle of it? Did Abraham? No. You know who walked through the middle? The Lord. You know why? Because he made the oath, and he affirmed the oath. Those are unconditional promises. God also, though, makes another category of promises. You know what those are? Those are conditional promises. Those are conditional promises. Those are promises that require something of you today. If you look up, when you get a chance, and I know we've had some of our ladies have studied the 91st Psalm. And the 91st Psalm is really a gem in the book of Psalms. If you're ever down, if you ever feel depressed, Read the 91st Psalm. I would recommend two Psalms, 91 and 23. Those are two Psalms that have the ability to lift up your spirit. 
But in the 91st Psalm, uh, you can great, take great encouragement and great com comfort. And that has done that for people throughout the centuries. But it's worth noting that the blessings, see the 91st Psalm makes a, a promise of blessings. Okay? Listen, if you want to be blessed by God today, raise your hand. Okay? If you don't, okay, there were, there was a couple of you out there that didn't want to be blessed. That's a little hard to believe. But, but the thing about the 91st Psalm is there's really two uh, caveats, two requirements. First of all, you have to be a believer. Okay? So listen to me. If you're not a believer today, you, don't, you have no expectation of receiving these blessings. I'm sorry, but that's the truth. That's the reality of the Word of God, okay? And the second thing is, it's not just that I don't believe the 91st Psalm is written to all believers. And I'll tell you why I believe that. The benefits that are, that are spoken of in the 91st Psalm are targeted to, towards believers who meet a certain requirement that's delineated in the Psalm, okay? Do you know what the requirement is? Read the first verse. If you have your Bibles there, it's the, 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 the 91st Psalm is full of what I would call conditional promises. And God promises to do certain things for us that are hinging upon our doing certain things that are required of us. And verse 1 says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. You see, the problem with Christians today is there's a very small percentage of them who are dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. Most of them have withdrawn from that condition in their lives. They were in that condition when they first came to Jesus Christ, when they had that first love, when they felt that intense love for Him and that intense love that He has for you. But then, as life, as the world, as the flesh, the three really, uh, the evil parameters that surround us. I was speaking on the radio uh, just this morning about the evilness that surrounds us in the world. I talked about the flesh uh, that is within us, the world that is around us, and then Satan and his demons. As those things begin to interfere with our lives, what happens is, is that we withdraw from that the, the secret place of the Most High. That word dwells can be better translated. It is a place where you go to rest. It is a place of quiet. And it is a place where you endure consistently. It's really a way of life. And it's, it's very similar to the word that we read in the New Testament, the word abide, as Jesus spoke of in John 15, 5. He who abides in me, and I am him, what does he do? He bears much fruit. See, you can talk that Christian smack to me all you want. But you want to know what? If you ain't bearing fruit according to the word of God, you need to get it together. Yeah. How blatant can I be? How utterly obvious can I be? You have a... Re Listen to me. You have a responsibility to Jesus Christ to be a fruit bearer. <laughs> Not just to be a sponge. Yeah. Suck up the word, but what should you do with it? You should disperse it to others. I'll probably scare some of you off. <clears throat> won't come back, but I'm sorry. We're to be fruit bearers today. We're to be people that make a difference in the world. The word, you know, when you abide in Christ, you, you stay with Him no matter what the circumstance. You have an unbroken fellowship with Him, and then you're able to commune with others of the like-mindedness, and you're able to change the world. Who are you changing the world for today? When's the last time you talked to somebody about Jesus Christ? Or, oh no, I can't do that. 
But oh yes, you're to go and make disciples. You should be about that business. So what God is saying to you, listen, if you want to experience the promises of the 91st Psalm, I know I said I was done 10 minutes ago, but if you want to experience the promises of the 91st Psalm, and those promises, let me give you a short list. Do you want to be protected? That's one of the promises. Do you want to be provided for? Do you want His blessings in your life? Do you want Him... Listen, do you want Him to honor you? Then you've got to honor Him first. That's the very first thing. You know, you must remain within the secret place of the Most High. And you remain, then you can, by doing that, you can remain in constant fellowship with Him. But people come to church Sunday morning, and then God doesn't bless their life, and they go, and they get bitter about it, and they wonder why. But you haven't honored Him. Honor Him first. He's God. You're not. You know what happened? How many people are here this morning, Arlene? About 70, 75? 87. 87. Praise the Lord. Do you know what would happen if 87 people left this church this morning and started honoring God 24-7? It would, it would cause an epidemic, a pandemic of Holy Spirit revival in this part of the country. 87, without a doubt. You know how some of the... If you haven't read the book in the back, you know we're having a... A revival in August. If you haven't read the book in the back, Revival Fire, you know how many people start revivals? One, two, three. Little groups of people that say, I'm going to honor God. From now on, I'm going to honor God. And when you develop that mentality in your life, you don't miss the boat that so many Christians are missing. Uh, to have a relationship with God is, and to put your faith in Jesus Christ. All you, all you have to do today, if you want to be God-honoring, I'll, I'll give you the first step to succeeding in that process. <clears throat> Ask the Lord, as you sit there today, we're going to do a prayer of invitation. Doug and the praise team are going to come up. Come on up, Doug. Praise team. Ask the Lord to reveal to you the sin in your life. And then come down here. You can write it on a piece of paper. You can put it in this box. There's a bunch of, there's a bunch of stuff in there. You know that? Stuff that people have placed at the altar. You can put your stuff in there. You don't have to, but it's good. The symbolism is good. I've seen it work miracles in churches and in people's lives. You can just come up to the altar and pray and put those sins at the altar. But if you're going to get to a God-honoring position in your life, and listen to me, guys, I know, because sometimes I don't honor God. So we have to be willing to reject that sin in our lives and put it behind us and go forward and do what He has for us, okay? So we're going we're gonna to have a time of invitation, and that time of invitation is, is developed for those who don't know Jesus Christ, but it's also developed for those who have sin in their life that know Jesus Christ. Because none of us is yet sinless. We only begin, we only reach that level when we become glorified. So the altar will be open today. Whatever your need is today, be it salvation, be it uh, 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 repentant, repentance and confession, if you have prayer needs, if I can pray with you, if you need uh, someone else to pray with you, if, if one of our ladies can come forward and pray with you, if you need counseling, we can talk about that. If you want to come up and tell us a praise when the Lord has worked in your life, whatever your need is today, we're going to open this altar here in just a couple minutes. And listen, God is calling. Don't just cavalierly say it's another invitation. God is calling. God is calling. It's April 6th. God is calling. What are you waiting for? How many times do you want to hear it? Over and over and over. I'm concerned that some of you are going to get hard hearts. 
You hear me over and over and over, and you won't come forward and let it. But it's written on the top of your heads. I'm mad at God. You can't be mad at God. Come on. You don't understand Him. That's okay. But you can't be mad at Him. Oh, this has happened. That's happened. I failed here. I failed there. He's failed me. She's failed me. la di da di da di da No. If you put your faith and trust in any man or woman, you're going to be disappointed. That's why you have to accept them for who you are. There's only one that will never fail you. And his name is Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Join us standing, please, as we pray. Stand up. Father, we, uh, we thank you for this time, Lord. We thank you for your word, which, uh, uh, Lord, uh, is so abundant, is so uh, full for us. We thank you, Lord, that we you've given us this building to, to meet in. We thank you, Lord, that, uh, that there's 87 people here this morning, that you've made it necessary for us to, to start an expansion project. We thank you, Lord, that our friends from Impacto, Alex and his family, are here this morning, Lord, as a testimony to us who, uh, who have come alongside them in their ministry. Uh, we just thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you. I want to thank you for how you've moved in my life. I want to thank you for how you've moved in, in the life, lives of the ones I love. I, I want to thank you, Lord, for how you've moved in our church. Lord, as, uh, as we come forward now for this time of invitation, it's, it's just my prayer, Lord, that uh, those the words that I've spoken, Lord, and I know my words aren't eloquent. I know my words, in fact, can be harsh at times. But I also know, Lord, that uh, your word, your word will never return null and void. So, Lord, as you have laid it on hearts this morning, we open up this altar as a as a recognition of our desire to uh, to to kneel before you. That's what this altar is for. So, Lord, uh, be it salvation, membership, prayer needs, whatever 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 transpires now, Lord, we give it all to you, and we pray all this. In the magnificent name of Jesus. Amen.